All right, perfect. Hi, everybody. Okay, uh, so my name is Denny Lee. I'm a developer advocate at Databricks. I'm a longtime maintainer and contributor to uh, Spark, uh, MLflow, and Delta Lake. So, but I'm here to talk about LLMs and the most important aspect of LLMs, which is we actually want care about the context of open LLMs. Okay, why do we care about this concept of open source? So, doesn't matter what language we're talking about today. It's very much into the idea of the difference between proprietary systems versus open systems, okay? Uh, you're more than welcome to ask questions. I'm gonna jump around between slides and also some demos. Hopefully the demos work. Okay, so um, I did wanna call out that this deck here is actually brought by a lot of people actually. So I don't wanna take full ownership of this type of stuff. This is definitely me getting help from a lot of other folks, uh, from Dolly contributors to Matei, to Brooke, uh, to Jim. So there's a lot of really good people. Um, but let me call out what's the most important aspect, okay? For all of you folks, especially for the last few years, when it comes to LMs, first of all, everybody know what's an LM, right? Yes? Yes? Yeah. I'm just trying to get the crowd involved, okay? So yes. All right. Cool. So we all know what large language models are, right? Okay. So our large language model is going to take over the world and take over our jobs. Yes? No? Okay, so I'm hearing a little bit of controversy, and that's actually what I sort of wanted to hear a little bit, okay? Now, the reality is it's not that simple, okay? Um, but the reason why I bring this topic up, okay, outside of things like, you know, GitHub Copilot, which basically can write Scala code for us now at this point, okay, is that we've been over the last three, four years really, really focusing on making larger and larger and larger models, okay? And so... For example, back in 2020, GPT-3 was 175 billion parameters and 300 billion tokens. But then Llama in 2023 is 65 billion parameters, 1.14 uh, trillion tokens though. Okay, so we get larger and larger and larger, which translates to millions upon millions of dollars for us to train these models. Okay, so if I was to follow that trend, the only way we can actually have really good large language models is if we spend an exorbitant amount of money and we train the living daylights of it. Is that a correct assumption, people? Yes? Okay. We're, do I hear yes or do I hear no? Okay. Maybe, right? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and change that context for all of you. Okay? So, no. You do not actually need to have a few billion dollars from Microsoft to pay OpenAI to go ahead and generate your models. Okay, that's the key context here. All right, uh, all right, um, sorry, there's some some numbers here I forgot about, $5 million just for the Llama one, okay? Uh, that's the one by Facebook, uh, sorry, Meta, whatever. All right, so the context basically is that the problem is what a lot of people forget about when it comes to large language models is they have a tendency to hallucinate. Can anybody tell me what hallucinate means here? Making stuff up. I think I heard that over there. That's exactly correct. Okay, so. All right, so this is demo time. Hopefully this works, okay? All right, all right. so uh, I know there's at least two people in the crowd that actually do understand this particular question. Oh, sorry. All right, which bagels are better, New York or Montreal? Do, does anybody understand this particular context here? I'm just curious. Good. Excellent. All right. So what's the right answer for everybody in the crowd? Is it Montreal or New York? I heard a lot more Montreal, which is exactly what I wanted to hear. Okay, perfect. Now, do you notice the answer this thing's giving you right now? Okay. This is a little bit messed up to put it lightly. Okay. And so the context I'm trying to get at is that these large language models can go haywire real fast. Okay. Now, uh, the site I'm using is called nat.dev. Uh, Nate uh, Nat Friedman, uh, he was the former CEO or something high up at GitHub. He was the reason for Copilot, okay, at GitHub. Basically, he put the site together so you can go ahead and run multiple models. So, in fact, I'm going to show you one that's already run. I'm not going to run it right now because I actually crashed <laughs> nat.dev just uh, about an hour ago, so I'm not going to do that, but um, here we go. Okay, so... If you look at uh, OpenAI's answer, okay, they actually have the correct answers here, okay? Montreal bagels are smaller, denser, and slightly sweeter than New York counterparts, yada, yada, yada. Okay, that's actually real. That's completely true, okay? Pythia 12b, okay, that's an older model. 
Um, it starts rambling. That's all it does. Okay. Okay. Here's my favorite one, though. This is Llama. Okay. Llama is the model that's coming from Meta. Sorry, I have a hard time saying this. From Meta. Okay. Which is 13 billion. It's one of the more popular ones to use. Okay. So here. Is an example. Oh, sorry, if you can't see it here. Uh, there you go. All right. It says here, Dov Mansky of Montreal's famous San Viator Bagels is set to open his new Lower East Side establishment on Houston Street. Okay. Now, why am I bringing this particular text up? If you were to read it like this and you knew nothing about bagels, you would think there's a guy named. Don Mavsky, who was from Montreal, San Vieter Bagels, and he was about to establish a Montreal bagel shop in New York, right? That's what it looks like from there, right? Okay. This is the San Vieter bagel site, okay? The family name is Morena, okay? So in other words, what just happened here is this llama, the, the meta model, literally made up who's the proprietor and chef of San Vieter Bagels. It made up the fact that it went ahead and produced, it's going to go ahead and open up a bagel shop in New York. All right? And so that's the key problem with these models right now. Okay? It's not just about it showing you the wrong weather. It's making up stuff, and if you don't actually know what's going on, you might mistake the fact that it's actually giving you real information. Okay? So now, don't get me wrong. If you train the living daylights out of it, like a GPT-4, okay, which costs a few million dollars, you actually will get a decent answer out of this. But then what ends up happening here is that it's all locked away by the folks that run GPT-4, right, i.e. OpenAI. Now, nothing against that. OpenAI is a great organization. I'm not trying to knock them. Quite the opposite. It's a really useful tool. You should go use it. Just understand when and why you're using these things. Okay, it's not just about blindly looking at it because they would literally give you the wrong answer and it looks like it's actually the right one. All right, back to the slides. So fortunately, the demos did work. Sweet. All right. So there's a lot of other things here. I'm going to sweep through the slides because I, I don't want to be blocking you guys from food, okay? But the context really here, quick here is basically... It's not just about the hallucinations. It's also malicious activities. Some of these models have been trained with biases, so they have built-in biases right in it, so they'll actually literally make judgments of entire ethnicities, entire genders, all wrong based on you going ahead and training on the wrong subreddit. I'm not being facetious. That's exactly how what happened, okay? All right. And then often it'll actually just give you the example I don't know, which is better than what happened to Samsung. Does, it, does anyone know what happened to Samsung with ChatGPT? Yeah, go for it. Exactly. Okay, I think I heard you correctly. <laughs> so that's exactly right. What happened is Samsung employees put secret private information into their chat, into the public ChatGPT model, and so the financials and trade secrets of Samsung are showing up in GPT-4 now, okay? That's a bad thing, all right? So that's the context, okay? People actually have to know what they're doing with this data. Okay, so can anybody tell me in simple terms what's a language model? I know I just went through that. I told you the possibilities, the how cool it is, but can you tell me what it is? Say again? Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I keep forgetting I'm not a mic. Okay. It's a token predictor. I've got plenty of slides for math, but unless you want me to p want to run over me and kill me for preventing you for the food, I'll skip to the, the easier version of it. But if you do want to discuss exactly the details, I do have slides for that, but I'm not going to do that today to you, okay? This is the definition I like using. Uh, yes, it's the easier version, but it's like a friend who's surprisingly good guesser, okay? Uh, because they have a lot of context. Exactly with the example, basically, words are next to each other, okay? Words then become tokens. 
If they're constantly next to each other in lots of different phrases, lots of different sentences, then there's an association. There's a predictability, a probability that's associated that if you say A and B and you see D, well, guess what? Probability is that you, D should show up whenever I ask A and B. That's pretty much it, okay? Now, obviously, that's the oversimplified version. I do have the, the cooler version, but again, I'm not going to do that to you, okay? But here's the key thing. If you go ahead and focus on building the models, you forget this fundamental concept here on the right. I'm going to describe this a little bit later. This is the idea that your data is the IP. All right? The idea that the, the intellectual property isn't the model, it's actually your data. Just like Samsung going ahead and giving up their trade secrets to GPT 3.5, ChatGPT, same concept. Okay, so how can we solve that problem? Now, I got this little thing, a hero arrives, Dolly 1.0. I also want to call out, I'm from Databricks. I'm actually not trying to sell Dolly. I want to be very clear. I've got Dolly stickers if you guys want that too, but I'm actually not trying to sell Dolly, okay? Dolly is a proof of concept. That's what Dolly is, okay? That's so that's why the words are there, okay? What do I mean by a proof of concept? Uh, actually, I'm going to skip the slide. There you go. Okay, perfect. The key context of Dolly was that we could take a two-year-old model, train it with a little bit of data, and still get solid results. Okay, that's the thing to remember. We actually only paid 30 bucks, okay, to train what the data was basically the standard data that OpenAI uses. And instead of paying $5 million, we paid 30 bucks to train the model. So that's pretty cool, right? And that's the proof of concept. That's the call out that you don't actually need a ton of data. We're, we used to think that you need millions upon millions of rows in order for your LM to work. Reality is you can actually get it down to 15,000 or in some cases less. Providing you know what questions you're asking and what questions you want answered, you don't need nearly as much data as you think for an LM to work well. And you can use an open source model. You don't need a closed source model to do this. Okay? And so because of the fact that we recognized, uh, by the way, literally when we were doing this, we, we even us at Databricks, we assumed that we were going to have to spend millions of billions of dollars. We did the initial test and it turned out that basically with 30 bucks, we actually got a really good working model. So what eventually happened next, we, we wanted to make this model commercially available because we wanted a data set that was available for everybody. Uh, so when we say Dolly 2.0 is the world's first truly open uh, instruction tuned LM, what we're actually saying is that not just the model is open source, the underlying data that we use to train the model has also been open sourced. So in Hugging Face, you'll see a Dolly 15K. That's 15,000 Q&As that were generated by the 5,500 Databricks employees. That's literally what happened, okay? So it's all free. It's available for you to use. Commercial, it's commercially available, so you're more than welcome to play with it. All right? So we paid about 100 bucks for resources to train the sucker. That's it, okay? So you can say, again, not $5 million, $100, okay? With surprisingly good performance. All right. So, for example... We ask Dolly these questions, and you actually end up having good answers. All right, so uh, let me see. Okay, here we go. What are the techniques that make good espresso? So you all are in Seattle here, so um, I'm not going to ask Dolly this, but can anybody tell me what's the best espresso place here in Seattle and do not answer Starbucks? Okay, Umbria, I will, f I will get into fighting words with you. Only because, no, no, don't get me wrong. I love Umbria. But Vivace, if somebody in the back said Vivace, that's the right answer. Now, of course, that is complete and under bias, okay? So let's call that out. But the point I'm trying to get at is that you want to go ahead and actually ask questions like this. You're going to get biased, right? So if, if it was trained by me, you're probably going to get that answer. Well, I'm probably not going to be able to pull that off today. Let's see. Okay. All right. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay. Sorry. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Oh, okay. Sorry. This is what happens when you run live demos and you forget what you're doing. Ha, uh, ha, Okay. 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 
Okay, sorry, I don't know if you can read it. So it's trying to... Okay, so obviously this model is wrong, <laughs> right? Now, as much as I want to joke about this particular concept, the one I, what I'm trying to get at is actually this, more or less this question. Um, all right, so what are the techniques to make good espresso? So I already had pre, pre-run this thing, uh, again, on that.dev. I'm going to switch to Databricks Notebook to, get, uh, to give you some context. But okay, long story short, GPT-4 actually has a decent answer, okay? It talks about high-quality coffee beans, invest in a good espresso machine, use a good grinder, dial grind size. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm geeking out on coffee. I apologize, but that's what I do, okay? All right. Now, in the case of uh, Pythia, which is, incidentally, the base model that Dolly uses, you notice that basically all it does is answer what are the techniques that make great espresso and repeat it over and over and over again. So not very helpful, is it? All right. Uh, if I go to Llama again, all right. Um, actually, you know what? Let me just show you this one version. Of it. Da, da, da. Okay. So when I go ahead and run on the Dolly 3B data set, it actually gives me a, a decent answer in terms of how to make coffee. And then on the Vol Dolly uh, V212B, it actually does even a better one, okay, in terms of what the, what makes a good, what are the techniques that make good espresso. Now, GPT-4 does a wonderful job, okay? Now, remember, Dolly V2, though, is based on only 15,000 rows. So how, why do you think Dolly V2 could still have a relatively good answer uh, versus GPT-4. Can anybody guess? Go for it. Whoa, anybody else? Both are correct answers. Less noise and train on coffee. So, basically, long story short, yes, the first answer is extremely correct because there's two people that actually t put the data sets in there. One, one guy's named Rob Reed, the other guy's me, okay? We're the ones that put the data set in there. That's why you actually have it. So obviously the quality of your data comes into play on how well your model operates. So again, back to the context of the data is your IP. All right. So if I, on the other hand, oh, darn it. Ah. Again, live demos. Ha-ha. All right, there we go. If I go ahead and run this one on the hand, because we have uh, the Llama 7B one, that's, the again, the meta one, okay? You notice that basically this is literally an advertisement for La Pavioni. That's what it is. So crappy data. So it doesn't matter that it has, it's a 7 billion token model. Because it was trained on crappy data, that's why it has a crappy answer. All right. Now, there is a point to all this, okay? So, obviously, I talked about the fact that basically with OpenAI, oh, sorry, the impacts of Dolly, basically, we're able to go ahead and create something really cool for a really cheap price. So, Mike Conover was the lead developer who actually created this, created Dolly. So, basically, he's, he's called out. We've taken a, 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 a simple data set that's commercially available, and now you've got decent answers. For a much smaller amount of data than we thought, we didn't need millions of data. You'd have to scrape the entire internet. You only need 15,000 rows and for 100 bucks of training. That's all it took. That's great. There's, it is, but remember, I, I, what I said, Dolly's a proof of concept. So, for example, what happened right afterwards, Ben Harvey from AI Squared, he went ahead and ran, a, he's got a new version of the model called D Lite, Dolly Lite, okay? And he trained it for 10 bucks, okay? Uh, and then basically this, we're, there's this continuing trend that we, instead of trying to build one gigantic model, we build lots of little small models and we glue them together. So that's why you hear people talk about Langchain. That's why you hear people talk about basically ensemble models. doesn't matter what the technique says. The point is that you don't necessarily need to have these gigantic models, millions of dollars to solve the problem, especially if you are purposely building it for your company's IP. All right. Now, 
the, I've, I want to finish off with the context of, so why open models though? Okay, so uh, y'all are familiar with Yan LeCun? Yes? Okay, well he's a, if you ever play with the MNIST data set, the MNIST demo model for deep learning, that's Yan LeCun, okay? So he's the, uh, uh, the, the key guy uh, who, for, uh, from Meta uh, for when it comes to deep learning AI. And so he calls out the fact that basically we have to make large language models open in order for us to actually validate, verify, ensure there are no biases, things of that nature, okay? So we've got somebody from Meta, and it, which is sort of ironic, by the way, because guess what Meta did? They produced a llama model that's closed. Yet Yan LeCun is actually calling that out. Andre Kaparthi, he's the chief scientist for OpenAI. Extremely cool. Uh, if you ever want to learn anything about deep learning, he still has his uh, course on Stanford that's uh, on YouTube. That's a great way to jumpstart your stuff, uh, to learning this stuff. He even calls this out. He's from OpenAI. They have a proprietary system. He calls out the fact that basically even with the GPT systems, they're going to start utilizing smaller models instead of these gigantic models in order for, for them to work. Okay? And then I'm sure so most of you have seen the Google no moat uh, uh, note, okay, on Y Combinator or Hacker News or whatever else. Basically, the call out from Google was that these open systems are actually preventing or going to take over what Google or OpenAI or any other closed systems that is about to do. Okay? So the key important aspect here is that the very people that are luminaries in this space have all jumped aboard to talk about openness because we actually have to understand why these models and how they work. And uh, let me, oh, so there's a lot of really good ones. So I'm just keeping the slides here, but for example, Luther AI, Mosaic ML, Hugging Face. Um, Hugging Face has a leaderboard as well. I I'm actually gonna share these slides so you can all download them and just use them. You don't actually have to take pictures. So the context is basically uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a leaderboard of all the different open source models that are available. So you can go ahead and check how they all operate and how effective they are. But the other aspect, which I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you, again, like I'm from Databricks, but I'm talking about other companies. You'll notice that, okay? So for example, Robust Intelligence has an AI risk database. So every person's model, open model, they actually assess in the open community to figure out how risky or what biases, what issues each one of these models has. So as you go in and try to understand which models to use, do, again, doesn't matter which language you're using, you can go ahead and actually use resources like this to better understand which models are useful, which models are biased, okay? There's also another one by John Snow Labs, NLP test. John Snow Labs is based out of here in Seattle. Again, same principle. Uh, you can use the NLP test to test out their various LLM models. In the end, oh, that was weird. Is it my end or? Air. <laughs> okay, that was weird. Okay, all right. You know what? I'm just going to literally end, end here so that way we all can eat, okay? So in order to accelerate your LM journey, haha, <laughs> I'm doing all marketing on you. All right, the, co the whole context here is that you have to understand how these models are useful and how these models aren't. It's okay to use proprietary systems. I'm not against it. You just have to be aware of what they are and you have to be aware of their limitations. In the end, you're gonna curate the relevant data. If you're trying to do it for your company, you're gonna to use the company's data. If you're gonna use the company's data, you wanna be careful using a proprietary service that will train on your data. If, you've, if you're using a proprietary service that's training on your data, what are you doing? You're literally giving up your competitive edge because remember, the data is your IP, okay? And so that's it for, for my little spiel. So that way we can eat. But I did want to say, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to ask me now or we can ask them afterwards. We're cool. All right.